Wise Child by Monica Furlong, Chapter 14, The Language. Juniper recovered quite quickly once she had discovered the reason for the terrible pain in her head. She and I looked at the wax doll together. I never understand, Juniper said wonderingly, how people can hate one another so much. Why does Maeve hate you so much, I asked curiously. Many years ago, Finbar and I loved each other. Maeve persuaded Finbar that he loved her better than he loved me, and he left me. But ever since then, even though she no longer wants Finbar herself, she has regarded me as an enemy. And in a way I am. I don't care for her sort of magic. She could use a doll again, I said, against you or me. No, said Juniper. Not now that we know. In the future we can protect ourselves, what I call clear water. Juniper made clear water with well water in which rowan leaves had been steeped. Each day we bathed ourselves in it, remembering to touch every part of our bodies. My first thought, once I knew Juniper was all right, was for Bran. Coleman told me later that the man on the black horse had caught the pony and taken him away, presumably once he realized that he was safe back with Juniper. To begin with, I had nightmares that he might come to Juniper's house to snatch me away. He won't do that, Juniper said. Maeve would have given him his instructions. A sorcerer like Maeve does not dare to trespass on the domain of a Doran like me, just as I would not dare to trespass on her property. Or at least I'd rather not. We both have more power when we are in our own places. There was a question that I wanted to put to Juniper, only I did not really know how to put it into words. Maeve is wicked, isn't she? I said at last. I was thinking not just of the wax dolls, but of the sad, ragged children I had seen stumbling under the weight of that tree trunk. Juniper shrugged. That's not the word I like to use. That's not a word I like to use, she replied. She does not live in the rhythm, however. She uses her power for her own advantage, and that is always a pity, because it does great harm. What I want to know is, my voice trembled as I spoke, if Maeve is wicked, does that make me wicked? Juniper turned to me. With a warm, loving smile. Of course, of course not, she said. Perhaps you have heard some of May you have some of Maeve's power within you, but you are going to use it for good. That is something that everyone has the choice to do. Was it wicked of me to run away and see Maeve? I don't think it was. Though it was a bit dangerous, you just needed to find something out for yourself. Did you mind when you found out that I had gone? I missed you. Juniper said carefully. I love you, you see, and I love having you here, but you are free to leave whenever you wish. I felt as if some cramped, frightened part of me had begun to expand inside me. I think I lived partially to punish you for making me work so hard, I said. Yes, I know, she said, and we both fell into silence. You Aren't, aren't you angry with me, then? I asked at last, puzzled. Juniper thought about it for a bit. I realised that she always thought before she spoke. No, I don't think I am, she said at last, and that seemed to be the end of that. If I had thought my running away would change anything in my life with Juniper, I was wrong. She still worked me just as hard, both at my lessons and at the household chores. You know, the more you do, the more you need to be stretched, she said to me one morning as I was puzzling over some difficult mathematics. I hate being stretched, I said crossly. The days were perceptibly longer now, if not perceptibly warmer. The cruel east winds of spring made our outings abroad miserable. Juniper never let weather interfere with her expeditions, and I was out with her in Tilly most afternoons, cold, grumbling, often wet. One of the memories I carry of Juniper is her long hair blowing in the breeze, the rain running down her face. It was on one such endless walk across the moor that Juniper began to teach me something of great importance. Other people choose a tactful moment to say something that matters, if only to make sure of your concentration. Juniper never did that. She often chose a moment when I was tired, angry, busy or hungry, and then told me something that cut right across my mood. So it was on that horrible afternoon, when my hands were wet and blue with cold, as I carried an armful of wet heather, the wet had seeped into my boots, too, as it often did. I hate this, I muttered. But a marvellous cloud, said Juniper, looking up at the sky and not taking the slightest notice of my complaints. 
Look, like an old man with a beard. Then, without beating around the bush, he went on. By the way, there's a language you will have to learn. A language? Well, it's the language, really. That's what the Dorans call it. Eventually, you will see why. Latin, Greek, French, English. There are too many languages, I said crossly. This is quite different, truly. To start with, you just learn the sounds. You never write it down. You never learn grammar or vocabulary or anything like that. How do you know what it means, then? By the effect it has. You will have to take my word for that. Just learn the words and see what happens. The other thing about it is it's a secret language, and you must never reveal any of it save to other Dorans. Suddenly, Juniper started speaking in this other language, and she said something that sounded like... Arini, Glam, Karun. Soon, since I was obviously expected to repeat it, I did so sulkily. She repeated it again, and this time I got a little closer to her pronunciation. Those were not the actual words spoken. I cannot tell you those, of course. What's it mean, then? I told you, I can't tell you. Silly old language. I don't want to learn it. What if I don't become a Doran? You will forget it. How will I know whether I to become a Doran? Do you realize that now you ask me that question practically every week, sometimes oftener, you will just have to see like everyone else? Well, I know better after Beltane. Perhaps, I don't suppose so. I felt very cross indeed now, tired of impossible words that I didn't understand, mysterious ceremonies, a vocation that might or might not be mine, and that seemed to cut me off from everyone I knew except Juniper. I stood still out there on the moor, where it was just starting to rain again, and the sky was dark, painful colour of a bruised plum. I hate you, I said. And I stamped my foot. Juniper simply nodded and walked on. I had more cause to hate in the days and weeks that followed. From that day, Juniper started to teach me the language. It had to be learned by heart, sentence after sentence of it, each one as meaningless as the last. Time after time after time, she made me go back to the beginning, to... Arinye, Glarm, Karun... And upon the fountain, and upon that foundation, we built a whole edifice of lines that went on and on, apparently without end. In places, it sounded like a list of things. In other places, it seemed to have a kind of dramatic intensity. Some passages were, it seemed, sad; others joyful, even funny, judging by the expression on Juniper's face. What was so odd was the way we worked at it. All of a sudden, nearly all of our occupations were laid aside. We no longer read Latin or English. We no longer spent time over poetry or songs or stories, over mathematics or astronomy or music. Even the chores, cheese and butter making, cleaning, cooking, spinning, the work on the herbs were cut to a minimum, or else Juniper made me recite strings of words that I chopped or stirred. Begin wise, child, she would say. Arini, Gram, Karun, and wearily I would start the litany once more. If you would only tell me what it meant, I would say tearfully, enraged at the sheer selfish senselessness of it. I can't, she would say, or if I did, it wouldn't mean anything to you. Everyone has to learn it this way. Have we nearly got to the end, I asked rashly. I rashly asked her once. Oh, nowhere near, she said, laughing, as if I had made a joke. At first, a whole evening, a whole morning, a whole afternoon would be spent unutterably boring in the unutterably boring process of her speaking the words to me and repeating them after her until of her speaking the words and me repeating them after her until I could remember them. It was cruelly baffling sitting there or standing. She preferred me to stand so I did not go to sleep, reciting words I did not understand hour after hour. Sometimes I felt as if the words were taking me over. Sometimes I could not sleep at night because the words were running obsessively through my brain. And sometimes I burst into tears when Juniper made me go back to the beginning and recite it all once more. Be brave, wise child. It is hard, I know, but it will make sense one day, I promise you. A thought struck me. Did you learn the language when you were young? Yes. From uni? Yes. And she was much tougher about it than I am, I can tell you. She once made me do it all night and begin work the next morning as if nothing had happened. I could imagine uni's determination. And were you glad later? Of course. The trouble with it is there just isn't an easy way of learning it. 
or I wouldn't make you suffer like this. This was patently the truth. However cross I sometimes got with Juniper, I knew that she always told me the truth, in the way that some grown-ups don't, and that she always cares about me. It made me somewhat, it made up somewhat for the misery of my present life, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, racing through the chores, and then reciting until lunchtime. We would have a bowl of soup and a bit of cheese, and then recite most of the afternoon. Juniper then allowed me a walk or a game. We did the outside chores, had supper, and then I had to recite again until late at night. I don't think I can stand much more, I said to Juniper once. I had gotten past feeling angry or doubling, or doubting the sense of what we were doing. It had become life to me, all by itself. For the past day, I had had a sensation of something growing and swelling inside me like a boil or an abscess ready to burst. You must keep going, said Juniper, and then I felt sure that I must, through my new and terrible tiredness, my busy dreams in which I sometimes now actually repeated words of the language, and through a state in which I seemed unable to eat or sit still, to rest or think, to read or to work. One evening I was lying exhausted on the cushions by the fire, reciting as usual, struggling with sleep. Every time my eyes closed, Juniper would say urgently, Stay awake, wise child. It was torture to stay awake. I wanted to go to sleep more than anything in the world. So tired was I that it seemed as if out of the corners of my eye objects moved uncannily. A bunch of herbs hanging from a rafter. Pearl, the poker. The herbs seemed to be swinging in a non-existent breeze. The cat to be gently floating in the air. A poker to be wagging like a pendulum. But as soon as I turned, quickly, suspiciously, they were perfectly still. But then the sounds began small, rushing noises at first, as if I could hear mice in the walls. Sometimes it seemed more like a whisper, somebody speaking just too softly for me to hear what they said. A few minutes later, worse started to happen. It was as if everything started to breathe, the floor, the chairs, the harp, the fire. I was plainly terrified. I could feel goose pimples coming out in my flesh and the hair rising on my head. Everything's breathing, I said to Juniper. It came out as a sort of complaint. I could not tell her of my fe I could not tell her of my feelings, but I saw her eyes resting thoughtfully on me as if calculating something. Good. Then try once more. Arigny, Glam, Karun. It did not occur to me not to obey. With infinite weariness, the words began. The words forced out of my mouth, as though thick, as if through thick porridge and I began the hateful recital all over again. Almost at once, something very strange started to happen. I realised this time that I was only conscious of the words for some of the time, and that there was now no longer any effort to remember. What was so peculiar was that this time I had the sensation that the words were uttering me, that sometimes I was the speaker and sometimes I was the hearer, that sometimes wise child disappeared altogether and sometimes I was more wise child than I had ever been before in my life. The words rolled on as mystifyingly as ever, and I was dimly aware that I was coming to the end of all that I had learned so far. I finished what I knew, and the words hung in the air for an instant, and then Juniper and I, in unison, began to recite lines that she had never taught me, and yet they were as familiar to me as my own self. These lines went on for what seemed to be another stanza, and then stopped, whereupon something even more remarkable happened. Ruby looked up from her elegant pose on the hearth and remarked in a voice both high and sonorous, Arenye, glam, caroon. Ruby, I said to Juniper in amazement, and I saw her nod and smile that we had shared this moment. She came to me and kissed me. That's over, wise child. You can go to bed now and have a long night's sleep. Tomorrow you will try on the green dress, and on Thursday we will start our journey to attend Beltane. I stumbled exhausted up the stairs, and Juniper helped me off with my clothes and tucked me into my nest. She kissed me and sat beside me. I wanted, I badly wanted to think about the strange thing that had happened to me, but I was drowning in the peaceful ocean of sleep. I was not me, I mumbled to Juniper in one last effort to hold on to the experience. I know, she said. Isn't that a strange feeling? <laughs>